Welcome to the script interview with Ulla Fetjof Nurheim, who is a physician, professor of medical ethics, and director of Bergen Center for Ethics and Priority Setting at the University of Bergen in Norway. Nurheim has done extensive work on distributive justice, inequality in health, priority setting in health systems, and research on how to achieve universal health coverage and the sustainable development goal for health. We're really happy that you could be with us online today and be part of GRIP's mini-series on the connections between COVID-19 and global inequalities. It's really great to speak to someone with a background in both medicine and philosophy. And the first question that I wanted us to start with is quite a big question on how the global response to the corona outbreak is revealing inequalities in um, global health systems, in your opinion. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a, a great question. And in my view, I think it's um, a little bit early to kind of compare countries uh, and the global response, how it affects different countries, because the, uh, the, the pandemic itself is developing at different speeds in, in different countries. So I think what is most striking is how this pandemic and the response to the pandemic reveals inequalities within countries. So just think of what we see now in, in the US, where uh, we see that there is higher mortality among the Afro-Americans and the Latinos. Um, very substantial increase in risk, probably because they have more comorbidities and other risk factors, and they might also um, have more difficulties with social distancing. And also the measures, uh, many of the well-off can stay at home in their own homes and work from home, uh, while a lot of people with lower income, for instance, don't have that opportunity. So I think the effect both of the virus itself and the uh, um, economic and political response to the virus affects people very differently. And it's very clear that those who are already worse off are usually hardest uh, hit. We see that in terms of more unemployment, more poverty, less access to, to food that many get uh, through uh, the school system. So it's really revealing um, how this pandemic affects people very differently. And this is very consistent with what we see in health in general, that we know there is a substantial social gradient in health outcomes. In a, in a city like Washington DC, for instance, Michael Marmot have documented that life expectancy is about the difference in life expectancy among the poorest and the richest in DC is about 18 years. So this is uh, not unknown from before, but it's been revealed once again with, uh, with this pandemic. Of course, we see similar trends in, in countries like um, South Africa, Brazil, where we see people affected in the slums um, much more harder because social distancing is, is so, so difficult. That said, I think the global response um, in many ways have been remarkable. Uh, the, the World Health Organization and a lot of other organizations have really come together trying to see how it's possible to develop a full response and a lot of countries have already now pledged uh, many billions of dollars for uh, developing vaccines, testing out treatment, testing uh, new and existing drugs, um, and uh, also giving advice, um, pooling data. So all uh, the publications from researchers now are pooled and made accessible uh, for everyone, uh, also through WHO channels. So I think the global response in many ways have been remarkable, uh, although we see all those uh, differences between the, the worse off and the better off. Do you think that there is also, just going a bit further on what you're saying about the responses, do you think there's also a difference 
between how the scientific community has been able to mount a quite quite a joint response and, and there seems to be quite a lot of knowledge sharing and kind of collective work going on as compared to to the political scene where that kind of cooperation hasn't really uh, been as successful and, and had quite a lot of other challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if we think of, of countries and the political response, we, we have seen not a global response, but a very nationalistic response. So each uh, country is fighting for themselves. And we see that especially with uh, security equipment, PPE. Uh, so uh, those who, uh, who can afford to buy and can grab the equipment uh, have done so, and a lot of other countries have uh, been much slower to acquire this kind of scarce uh, resource. So in, in many ways, there's been very different responses um, among politicians um, compared to like the scientific community, for instance. Exactly. What do you think, I mean, it's still early to say, but what do you think could be said that we can learn so far in terms of the need for, for strong both national and global health institutions in, in tackling pandemics more broadly? Yeah, I think that the next big challenge will be if there is a vaccine developed, um, that, that there is a need for global governance and a global mechanism for allocation of vaccines. And I think the political realities are so that countries that can afford and that already have contracts with companies that are developing, there's a race to develop vaccines now, that the rich countries will get um, the, the lion's share of, of the vaccines. But there are initiatives trying to develop a strong global mechanism for making sure that there is uh, equitable distribution of, of vaccines when this time comes so that it's based on need and ability to pay. But I don't think we have those strong global institutions yet. So I think we will see very interesting development uh, in, in, in this respect. What we have learned on at the national level is how important it is to have a, a pandemic preparedness and we see substantial differences between the countries uh, as well. So like Brazil have been slow in the response and, and we see the effect countries like many uh, the, some of the Nordic countries we are from Norway and, and we see that we have a, a strong welfare state and a strong economy. So a full lockdown uh, has been possible and has been quite effective at the same time as um, people have been protected by uh, um, unemployment uh, benefits and other things. Of course, people are affected also in, in, in rich countries and very unequally, but we see a qu uh, quite a difference between countries in that respect uh, as well. And we, it seems to be a difference. Interestingly, those countries that have cent central governments uh, do, do better than um, in countries where, where uh, um, it's much more decentralized, so you, you don't have this global or, or the national rapid response as we have seen in some countries. I see. So going a bit further on the national scale, do you think that there are differences between, for example, different healthcare models as well, whether you have private or public provision, um, and how that impacts on distributional outcomes, both in terms of access to healthcare, but also in terms of how pandemics are dealt with. Yes, definitely. And um, what I hear uh, from my American colleagues and, and also read um, both the newspapers and, and research is uh, that in a, in a system like the American, where there is um, a, a large private sector and a, a quite fragmented system, that it's been very hard to access tests um, and, and get access to, uh, to uh, services for those who need. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, the, the pandemic has revealed the weaknesses with, uh, with uh, predominantly private healthcare systems. So even if you have uh, Obamacare and a sort of universal healthcare system, it's quite fragmented and uh, the, the, the response and access to services has been very unequal. While 
again, looking at uh, countries with national health uh, systems, at least, uh, everyone knows that access to services is free and it's been um, more equal access to what is needed, both in terms of uh, equipment, testing and, uh, and treatment for those who have needed hospitalization. Because this question about distributional outcomes is also quite challenging. Um, if we think in, in a bigger picture in terms of distributional, sorry, distributive justice, how you think about healthcare within that kind of larger perspective, do you have any any comments on that? Yeah. So. Um, it's it's interesting because we, we, there are large health inequalities across countries. So uh, many of low and middle income countries have a lower life expectancy and a higher disease burden than high income countries. This is well known, of course. Um, but interestingly, what we have seen so far is that for COVID, it affects uh, uh, mostly um, uh, people uh, of high age um, and the proportion of uh, old people in many low-income countries is much lower. Uh, so, so far we haven't seen uh, such an impact in many low-income countries. Uh, so it's a kind of a paradox that in this sense, as, at least for now, it seems like many of the, the, the high-income countries have been harder hit, but this might change when we, when, uh, uh, when we see the development of the pandemics. It's too early to tell uh, the development in, in Africa, for instance, and I work a lot in Ethiopia, and, and they are reporting uh, a sharp rise in cases and deaths uh, just now. So this might develop, and we don't know yet whether malnutrition, TB, HIV, all these other diseases will act as um, risk factors so that we might see a, a different pattern of, of how the disease hits in, in those countries. So that's a bit early to say. We've had some of the, the interviews that we've done so far have also highlighted how the, the lockdown measures have been applied to some extent in, in in very similar formats, but that that has very unequal effects um, in different places because, as you mentioned in the beginning, not everyone has the the luxury of socially distancing themselves within their homes or not being able to go to work. Um, as a health professional, how do we think about those kind of um, trade-offs or where it's not, I mean, there's no correct answer, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, I've been thinking much about that and, and been very concerned. So I do a lot of work in Ethiopia and we have had regular weekly meetings with the uh, uh, Ministry of Health officials and others uh, working in Ethiopia. And, and what, what they report is that um, the lockdown mechanisms uh, are affecting people so they are much more poverty uh, and because some of the access to services has to be paid out of pocket there's also a drop in in access to serv services because of these uh, lockdown mechanisms and added to that people are afraid of going to health centers and hospitals uh, for for the risk of of, uh, of the disease and even even health professionals are afraid of uh, going to work because they don't have enough protective equipment. So what we are worried about and what we know from earlier epidemics like the Ebola crisis in West Africa in 2014-15 is that the excess mortality, the, ex uh, the uh, uh, deaths in non-COVID or the, these other uh, patient groups is actually and was much higher. People died from malaria and other diseases during the Ebola crisis, and those numbers were much higher. And that's the big concern now that if we have, say, a 10 or 20 percent drop in the coverage or service provision for non COVID diseases in low income countries, that we uh, we'll see that a lot of children are not vaccinated, that uh, mothers don't go to health centers or hospitals to give birth, and that uh, they don't 
take the kids uh, for treatment if they have fever. Uh, so we have actually established a group that are uh, putting together advice on how to protect essential services of this kind um, for, for low-income low countries. And uh, the WHO is also working on, on, on uh, this type of advice and, and countries are trying to protect these services. But that's a, a really big challenge. So the lockdown mechanisms and the effect of the COVID also have other indirect effects that are really uh, problematic in, in many of these countries. And then, of course, add to this that people are, are uh, at home. It's very hard to work from home in a meaningful way in, in many uh, low-income countries. So uh, a lot of people, and especially the worst off, are hard hit by these mechanisms. And... Many have discussed that maybe following standard public health advice with a complete lockdown in a low income countries, um, uh, uh, that the, the side effects of this could be much worse than the effect of the, of the epidemic itself. So I think there's need for further discussion and for fine tuned uh, policy advice on, on what to do in, in, in those countries and what is the appropriate response. Do you think that um, some West African countries have um, the kind of experience that, that we can learn from in that regard in terms of how the Ebola crisis was handled? Yes, so there's a lot of experience from both Ebola and cholera epidemics and other, other disease outbreaks in many of these countries. And that might be actually why some countries are able to respond in, in, a, in a very efficient way. So uh, they have learned a lot and know a lot about identification of, uh, of, uh, of um, patients and the source of, of contamination and uh, um, detection of, uh, of uh, people who are spreading the disease and also hygiene and, and other advice. People are quite used to handling this kind of advice. So in many ways we can learn from that. Uh, also we know that acting very quickly has been very very important and uh, um, I think uh, even if WHO was a little bit late to respond in, in many views, uh, I, I also think that they responded as a big organization, they responded quite quickly and gave very good advice based on what they learned from the Ebola crisis. Exactly, yeah. My final question for you today um, relates to some of the debate that's been here in Norway actually about what kind of knowledge, what kind of scholarship we need um, during the corona crisis and I know that you you've been a bit involved in that public debate so I was wondering what your thoughts are on the role of the humanities and the social sciences within this kind of crisis situation. Yeah so um, I, I see there are kind of two big issues uh, um, related to the COVID crisis where we also need to think about as a society what kind of values are important and uh, and we need to reflect on those values and the first issue is what we saw in Italy for instance and in in New York and in some countries where the capacity for treating um, uh, COVID-19 patients were limited so in in Italy for instance there were scarcity of intensive care units and ventilators and they actually uh, proposed guidelines um, saying that they would impose an age limit for uh, which kind of, of patients would be admitted for, for intensive care units and, and ventilators. And exactly this issue about selecting whom to treat um, or is also an ethical issue. So it's, it's a medical issue uh, where you need medical knowledge, but it's also based on values. And the principles and values for how to allocate scarce resources are really important in, in this situation. And it will become so also for the allocation of vaccines, for instance. And uh, philosophers and ethicists uh, uh, in many countries have worked hard on this, uh, thinking about what is the most fair way to allocate scarce resources. So let me give one example for um, in, in uh, earlier epidemics where uh, 
you don't have enough vaccines to uh, to uh, vaccinate everyone uh, you need to choose whom to vaccinate first and one d discussion that's been uh, very hard in many ways um, is this issue whether you should vaccinate health personnel before others um, because one argument would be that if you vaccinate health personnel they will stay healthy and can help save more lives um, we don't do that uh, normally uh, we will treat everyone alike but in this special situation that's been an ethical issue that's been much debated and i think uh, there is a kind of consensus on uh, uh, accepting this, this argument. And the other is, of course, whether you should prioritize those uh, who can have really the highest chance of survival uh, from intensive care or whether you should have a lottery so that everyone have e equal access. People think that every life uh, has e equal value, but if you have to really prioritize between patients, uh, you need to have some principle for departing from equal treatment. And in, in these discussions, I think there is a great need for ethical thinking and reflection and, and building on what ethicists and others have uh, developed over years in giving advice um, on, on these kind of issues. The other, other big issue is, of course, the effect of lockdown and how to evaluate this so it's a kind of a huge experiment or a huge policy change where you you ask children not to go to school or to kindergarten people are isolated the, the elderly have to stay uh, at home being really isolated from others um, you are locking down um, whole industries big organizations and the economic compensation um, how is that distributed? So it's all related to um, who are most affected by lockdown and who are compensated. And what we see in many, many countries is that the better off um, the private sector tend to, to get more of the resources and be less affected than the worst off. So this issue of distributive justice is a key issue also when thinking about the lockdown and, and what kind of measures to lift uh, now for the next coming months. And philosophers and ethicists work, uh, working on political theory and distributive justice have, have much to say on this, I think, and how to think about uh, um, common values within a society, thinking about what is fair and, and also thinking about what is most efficient and how to make these trade-offs between fair distribution and efficiency is something that uh, ethicists and philosophers are trained to do. So I believe, of course, since I'm an ethicist, but I, 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 I've, in my experience, at least in Norway, uh, ethicists have had a role in the public debate around these issues. And as a society, I think we need these humanistic disciplines that can also help us think through um, really difficult issues in, in hard times. Uh, we need doctors and nurses and, and health personnel and, and others, uh, but I also think that we need people who know and have thought about these difficult issues. Absolutely. I think that's a good note to end on. The need to strengthen both humanities and social sciences within these quite challenging times. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us at Grip Yourself, Olaf Rodiov, and uh, we hope we can keep in touch and keep the conversation going. Thank you. It was nice to be with you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.